All right, so let's go and open prayer. We'll jump into Matthew. God in heaven, we, we are honored to be able to read, to study, to understand your word. Help us to do so with uh, intensity and uh, with seeking to understand, asking questions of the text, and understanding your truth. Thank you for those who are here. Help us to be able to, to love one another and care for one another. For those who are not, we pray that they are well, they recover. If they're sick, if they're traveling, or if they're just um, of us, just not in our vicinity. We thank you for those who are online and are able to participate. Help us to always be there for one another. Help us to demonstrate who you are through our words and our actions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are again in the Gospel of Matthew, and if all goes well tonight, I don't stumble over my words, and I get, and then everything seems to be just functional, just fine. Um, we should be able to finish the Sermon on the Mount tonight, um, as we uh, always do to make sure we understand the Sermon on the Mount. Once we get past the Sermon on the Mount, I don't think there's a, anything really controversial until we get to chapter 9. <laughs> it's a joke, because it's immediate. Um we want to make sure that our mindset is proper, and so we have to make sure that we're constantly uh, reminded of the fact that there are two administrations in Scripture, specifically after Moses, uh, and that's Israel and the church. We're in the church, not Israel. And there's two economies, specifically within uh, the majority of the Bible, and that is law and grace. We are under grace, under law. During the time of Jesus Christ, he was born under the law, and he was teaching those who were under the law. Matthew is not written to Gentiles. It's not written to the church. Matthew is written to Israel. It's important to keep that in perspective as you read the Gospel of Matthew. Not that we can't understand things in Matthew or apply things from Matthew, but we have to make sure we, we grasp it in terms to whom it was written. In the Sermon on the Mount, there are, uh, is addressed to people as Jews and to the nation as Israel in order to avoid judgment and wrath and enjoy entrance into the kingdom of heaven when it is established on earth. Uh, particular, we're going to be going into this, this lesson is going to be the righteousness properly displayed, evaluate properly the false message of the others. So we've gone over other portions of Matthew uh, 6 and going into chapter 7 as understanding the proper evaluation of, of uh, righteousness as being properly displayed. Here we're getting into specifically how we are to view or how Israel was to view the, the false teachers of their day and, for, and forward. In the Sermon on the Mount, there are two contrasts. That's from chapter 5 through chapter 7. Two contrasts. The first contrast is the righteousness that God demands versus the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. They have a, two different understandings. Everyone in Israel was taught by the scribes and Pharisees, and everyone did not have a Bible in their own house. They may know some portions of it, but they relied upon the scribes and Pharisees to tell them exactly how to understand the scriptures. Because of that, they were all kind of duped into this false understanding of, of what they said was proper righteousness. Jesus came and started talking to them and was telling them exactly what God's true righteousness standard is, speaking of behavioral righteousness. The second one begins in chapter 6, and that is the, the displaying righteousness before God or displaying righteousness before men. Um, he says that very clearly in chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So in this text, in dealing with this particular idea, we're, we're dealing with this idea of displaying righteousness. And so, and, and here we are, uh, in this text, Jesus telling them how to uh, avoid judgment and how to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the overall main thrust of the text. It is in the same vein of the Old Testament prophets, Joel, Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and that is to return uh, to God and and the kingdom proclamation from the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus is taking on that aspect. And when we get more into Christology, after we get through the life of Christ, we will explain, and this is on Sundays at 10 o'clock, by the way, how Jesus fulfills the office of prophet. 
because that's exactly what he's doing in Matthew during this proclamation of truth. He's telling the people what they need to do, what they need to understand, so that they can come back into right, proper understanding and alignment with God as the nation that God chose. The prophets called Israel to uh, the nation to believe in Jehovah and obey his law so that they can enjoy the blessing uh, in the kingdom. Now, this principle in, Ma in Matthew chapter 7, specifically beginning in verse 13 through the rest of the through the rest of the, the sermon, is clear. There it's it's a it's a simple concept. We call it one-way theology. There's only one way. This is contrasted to most, I would say, of even um, uh, I would say uh, American Christians that believe that there are many pathways to God. They don't want to sound judgmental or or seem to be very narrow-minded. Remember, because if you're narrow-minded, kind of interesting because it says past the narrow gate, that's supposed to be negative. Where they believe that a person over in Indonesia, Japan, Russia, China, wherever they are, if as long as they're sincere and they're seeking God, if they're no, no matter if they're going through Buddha or some other passage, who are we to judge? Well, the Bible says very clearly that there's only one way for a person to understand and get to what we would consider to be um, reconciled to God, go to heaven, any of those uh, nomenclatures you'd prefer to use. The topic is not one way for an individual to be reconciled to God, and it is true that there's only one way to be reconciled to God, that's through Jesus Christ. Even for the Jews of that day, they had to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's not being disputed here. But Jesus then uses um, the, the concept of the, of the one-way theology in three specific examples. The narrow and the wide gate, there are two paths, there's two trees, and there's two foundations. Last week, we went through the narrow and wide gates in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter to the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow and leads to life, and there are few who find it. Um, and we concluded last week that those who entered this wide gate and followed the wide path of the scribes and Pharisees would not enter the kingdom of heaven. They would actually be excluded from life in the kingdom. Then we went on to Matthew 5, 7, 15 through 20, which is about trees and fruit. Um, a lot of people find this to be extremely difficult. I don't think it is. All, I think all they had to do was read it in context. It says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. When we dealt with this last time, we made the obvious, the, 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 the obvious observation of verse 15. What's the point? Beware of false prophets. It doesn't say beware of false Christians. It doesn't say beware of false believers. It says beware of false prophets. The trees are representative of those individuals who are prophets, proclaimers, teachers. A good prophet, a good proclaimer, a good teacher, specifically in the context of Israel, would be known by their fruit. The fruit of the prophet is not their activity. It is not their good deeds or their bad deeds. The fruit of a prophet is the message, and we read about that in Matthew chapter 12 to make that clear. I don't think there's any way to be able to tell whether or not someone's a good teacher, especially if they're coming into the town for the first time and making a proclamation. Well, I don't know if their message is true or not until I get sit down with them and really evaluate them over the next couple of months. No. Israel's given a specific command. We can also go back into law and understand this, that you evaluate their message. If their message is false, it doesn't matter how good they seem to be, you are to stone and kill them. Because they are false. 
Israel was to evaluate the words of those claiming to be prophets and determine if what they say matches up with the known word of God. And that brings us to Matthew 7, 21 through 23, which I have entitled, Not Everyone. So let's go ahead and give that a read, and let's go ahead and make some observations, ask some questions, because I find this to be much more difficult in, 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 uh, in, in how it's been handled, other than the tree and its fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So once again, not everyone. Now, in this particular text, this has been dissected. This has been evaluated. This has been torn apart by various different individuals with very different theological backgrounds. Obviously, they will go ahead and talk about, well, what do they mean by Lord? They will ask, it says, many will say to me on that day. Not just a few, but many will say to me on that day. They will evaluate what does it mean to, do, to practice lawlessness and, and various different ideas within this text, to which I want to share with you some of the commentators that you will typically find if you're having a book that's a commentator, or you look online, uh, various different popular websites have commentators that will basically try to tell you what things mean because very few people um, simply, uh, just not, don't mean to be offensive, simply just read the text and let it speak for itself. So Craig Kenner, uh, again, if you don't know the name, that's fine. Uh, you don't have to know. Um, here's what he really says about, about this. This is, says, the miracles Jesus mentioned are not necessarily false. It is possible to prophesy by the Spirit's inspiration and yet be disobedient to God and unsaved. To which he goes to, to, to Joshua, for an example. Now, if you want to know where this, this guy comes from, this is from the Bible background commentary, a commentary I like because sometimes it gives extra biblical information about where things are and geography and different things. But sometimes when he gets into theology, I'm going, what in the world are you talking about? Can you give me some examples, please? By the prophesied by the Spirit's inspiration and yet be unsaved? What, where? Who? And the example he uses is just, it's not accurate. Ulrich Lutz. Um, one of the more popular exegetical commentators, especially in the book of Matthew, a, a very popular um, exegetical type of uh, work, and a lot of people like it. And again, I, I, I like this guy. He seems to be, for the most part, pretty well. Except, man, when he gets into Matthew, it's, it's not great. All people will be judged on the basis of their works. And this leads to a polemic problem. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He then uh, goes into um, various different explanations. Matthew is thinking of the community of disciples. He's looking at the disciples. He's, he says, it changes. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So he says, oh, this is talking about the entire uh, basket of everybody that's ever existed, specifically that of the disciples. He's changed his topic from prophets to all disciples or all claiming to be disciples. Not all of its members will enter the kingdom of heaven. Although addressing the world judge as Lord is theologically correct, nothing will be decided on the basis of addressing Jesus correctly. Here's how he concludes. In the last judgment. Now, what judgment do you think he's thinking about? He's thinking of the white throne judgment over in Revelation chapter 20. Only those will be saved with whom the Son of Man has wants to have fellowship. And it will be based on their works. It's interesting because in his commentary, he goes, oh, it's not that Jesus is, is ignorant of grace. He's just going ahead and say something a little bit more specific. This, this individual, particularly, other than his exegetical work, his conclusions are just that. To which we go, you know, I, how do you reconcile Ephesians 2, Titus 3, John with this, and, they, and, he, and typically the answer is, 
Well, the grace gets you into, into like a beginning relationship. It starts you off. It, so God puts you in the starting, it gets you on the road and go, okay, now you're on the road and I'm going to root for you. But if you, if you veer, if you fall off, then you never were. To which you say, that's a pretty cruel game to tell someone. DJ Richardson, very popular website. I'm not going to steer you there, so, but it's a very popular website. Um, says this, according to Jesus in the verses above, which is the verses 21 through 23, these individuals believed they were saved and called Jesus Lord, but they did not live out their faith. We can understand that it's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. We must also live in accordance with what we believe. There must be a trial of good works that characterize our lives in Christ. It's not enough to believe or say you believe. Only those who perform properly are true believers, to which, again, we've gone over this on Sunday morning several times. We know this to be false, yet this is, this is the majority of commentators. So if you're reading Matthew and you're trying to figure out what does Matthew mean, you're going to get confused because, number one, they're not taking this as Israel at all. Who's mentioning Israel so far? Anybody? No. Anything about, about who Matthew's addressing? No. They're taking this as strictly to who? Anybody who wants to go to heaven. Our good friend David Guzak, I'll go tell you, this, this is the main commentator on Blue Letter Bible. I like the Blue Letter Bible. I recommend the Blue Letter Bible. I don't recommend its commentaries. Although it has other ones, this is, seems to me the main guy they like a lot. He says this, the warning that of Jesus applies to people who speak or say things to Jesus or about Jesus, but don't really mean it. Again, I have to say this because when you sit there and you take a look at this kind of text right here, there was a statement made a little while ago, which I think really makes sense now that I kind of see a lot of these commentators, is that it's not what the Bible says, it's what it doesn't say that really speaks to me. It's like you have to read between the lines and who becomes the arbiter of that truth, the person who is the commentator. Their mind is elsewhere, he says. Yeah, but they believe that there is value in the bare words and fulfilling some kind of religious duty with no heart, no soul, no spirit, only bare words and passing thoughts. Man, this preaches well, doesn't it? It really, it, it can, I, can, I can do a, a whole lesson on this. I can go ahead and really guilt trip you into, into thinking, are you really saved? If not, you better pay attention. You better come here more often. You better go ahead and start giving more money. And people just start doubting themselves because they start wondering, am I sincere enough? Have I done enough? Am I, am, I, am I thinking clearly enough? The warning, this warning of Jesus applies to people who say, Lord, Lord, and yet their spiritual life has nothing to do with their daily life. They go to church, perhaps fulfill some daily religious duties, yet sin against God and man just as any other might. Call into question the people who say they believe, yet their actions, by his standard, don't match up. This is the question I, any, any of these individuals, whenever I run into people who espouse this type of information, I always ask them, by whose standards are you going? If I'm like you, am I good? Am I, am I, am I going? To which they go, well, I'm not the judge. I go, then you don't know? Do you know? And, and, and just ask them that question if you ever want to have that, that conversation with somebody. And it throws them off because they start realizing that, I, that they become the arbiter of that truth. And, and I don't think anybody is trying to be mean. I just think they're, they have, haven't really done their work, number one, and, or two, number thought this out. Right? I, will, I will take you to Gospel Coalition. How to survive the scariest passage in the Bible. Did, did, you, did, did anybody read Matthew 7, 21 to 23 and go, Ooh. like, this is kind of scary, right? I call Jesus Lord, right? I, I think I'm doing good enough, right? But what, what happens if I'm part of the people that he does not know? How can I be sure? His name is Justin Dillay. Um, and he says, let me offer you two ways to maintain, even build assurance in the face of these frightening passages. He says, number one, recognize what it means to do the Father's will. 
Now, right off the bat, if he's calling it scary, who is he applying it to? He's applying it to everyone reading what he's reading, which is to the church, typically. Does he mention Israel? No. Does he mention the, the purpose of Matthew? No. Does he? No. He just basically says, this here would scare you if you think you're going to heaven, but you're not. So the first one, it says, recognize what it means to do the Father's will, to which he says, a true Christian, I love the, our love adjectives that are never in Scripture. A true Christian is someone who continually prays, Father, forgive my debts. It is the Pharisees who thank God that he's much better than others. A true Christian prays, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a true Christian. And so if you're doing that on a regular basis, if you understand you're humble before God, then you can be assured. Who's the focus upon? Who is your assurance based upon? Whether, Based upon what he says, it means if you do what the Father wills, then you can have assurance you're going to make it. Who's the dependence upon? It's upon you. Not upon the truth. Not upon the promises of God. And here's the second part. Recognize the primary knower here. I like the, This is... Again, I think his overall thought is not bad. It's not ultimately a question on whether we know him, as important as that is, but whether or not he knows us. Does he know you? Are you the kind of person Jesus is going to meet as an old friend in the last day? This is actually what he says. Is Jesus going to say, I know what you went through, and you went through a lot for my sake. You weren't ashamed of me, and I want you to know I'm not ashamed of you either. So let's examine ourselves, is what he says. Let's examine ourselves and ask, not only do I know Jesus, but does Jesus know me? Let's live in such a way that he will not be ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters on that day. And that's interesting because how does he, why is he not ashamed to call us brothers or sisters according to Hebrews 2? Because he died for us, has nothing to do with our performance. And then finally, um, Bob Wilkins. By the way, Bob Wilkins has stand, stood here before. You know, he's taught from, from this church before, um, to which I appreciated some Bob Wilkins, and I've had some some harsh words. <laughs> Not literally with Bob Wilkins, but, you know, in my office when I'm reading some of his stuff. Uh, people who call Jesus Lord, Lord, and make their case for the entering their, his kingdom based on their works were unbelievers. They had not done the will of the Father, which is believing in his son for everlasting life. And they also, that, that, this is the explanation typically from what we consider to be the grace camp, the, the GES, the, the, the Grace Evangelical Society, Free Grace Alliance, all those groups of which I've been affiliated with at one point or another. Dr. Cohn was on the board of trustees for the Free Grace Alliance, went to a Free Grace Alliance uh, conference a couple of years ago here in Kansas City. And for the most part, I really appreciate what they do. And I have been highly influenced by Bob Wilkins, and Bob Wilkins was also highly influenced by Zane Hodges, of whom I was highly influenced by as well. I have used this argument. Um, I have used this position to talk to people who would like to use this passage to try to demonstrate, hey, just because you believe in Jesus doesn't mean you're going to make it. I go, really? And so what I do a lot of times is take Matthew 7, 21, for example, and say what? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And I'll ask him, what is the will of the Father? And I'll turn to passages like John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And John 6, 40 also, which says, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who holds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up in the last day. So there you go right there. It's not what you do, it's what you believe that gets you into the kingdom of heaven. To which I was very proud of myself for a very long time. And then I started reading Matthew. And I go, it preaches well. It makes my argument very nice. It's a theological argument to try to say, here, it's not about the works, it's about the belief. And I, and I believe I've been able to demonstrate that several times. But that's not what Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is talking about. First and foremost, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter what? What? I want, I want, here, it's not rhetorical this time. The kingdom of heaven, okay. We've already studied this several times. The kingdom of heaven does not mean go to heaven, have eternal life, spiritual eternal life. It's not what it means. Interestingly enough, almost every single commentator used the word saved. Did you notice that? Interesting, the word saved, sozo, does not appear anywhere in Matthew 5 through 7. It's in Matthew 1, in Jesus' name, that he will save his people from the sins. And the next time you see it is in Matthew 8, where it talks about making somebody well. Because sozo basically means to, uh, does not mean to, to go to heaven. Sozo means highly contextual. It can mean make well, it can mean be delivered, various different understandings. In fact, there's nowhere in the book of Matthew where the word save, sozo, or any of its derivatives means to go to heaven. Anywhere. So, people have to insert it. Does it say eternal life? Now, we talked about life in, in Matthew chapter 7, in, including eternal life in the book of Matthew. It says, enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to maintain that concept. The outcome of doing the will of the Father is entering into the kingdom of heaven. As restated, this is not about entering the kingdom of heaven as a human. Sorry, this is, is, this is not about eternal life, spiritual life. This is about entering into the kingdom of heaven as a human, not a glorified saint, not after you die going to the kingdom of heaven. No one has ever said, when I die, I'm going to his kingdom. That is not stated in scripture anywhere. The kingdom of heaven is an earthly ministry, is an earthly kingdom, and is established when Jesus comes back. And the message to Matthew uh, that Matthew is giving here to Israel is about entering into that kingdom because it was being offered to those people at that time. They rejected it. Jesus said, cursed is this generation, for it will be given to another generation, which is not Gentiles, to so another generation of Jews at the end times. But it's always about a physical kingdom, and the promises made to Israel is about them entering into that physical kingdom as humans. Furthermore, we have to look at this in context. Verse 21 is not all of a sudden about some strange contrast. He's still in the, in the same area of conversation which begins in verse 15. And not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. We have to ask the question in context, who will Jesus evaluate according to this text? Who is he talking about here? Those who call Jesus Lord, who do miracles, cast out demons, prophesy in his name. What's the word prophesy mean? Does that mean tell the future? Now, it can, it can include that, but a prophet of God is, thus says the Lord. Who are they talking about? False prophets. Got to keep it in context. This is not about false prophets. This is not about false Christians. Anywhere else that you go in Scripture, specifically in John, the epistles, okay, talking to um, the talking to the churches, whatever you say, how do you know if someone's a false Christian? Just in general, any, any ideas about how you can tell how someone's a false Christian? <laughs> Stop it. Yes. It is their fruit. It is their message. The only way I can tell on whether or not we're on the same page and whether or not we have a clue on whether or not someone is saved is what you tell me about Jesus Christ, what you tell me about what he, what he promised, and we can, what you can tell me about what he did. 
So like, do you, are you going to heaven when you die? Well, I've been a really good person. I think I'm good. I don't think God will send me to hell. I've, I've tried really hard. What will be my evaluation? What you believe is not going to get you there. Now, we don't tell people whether or not they're going to heaven or hell, right? We've talked about that several times. We're not there going, go to, you're going to hell and you're going to heaven. We're not the determiner of that fact. We don't know what they believed in the past, and we don't know what they're going to believe in the future. But we never evaluate what they do to determine whether or not they are truly saved. Now, if someone is a horrible, rotten, stinking person, one who practices lawlessness, and they're in my midst, they go, I know I'm going to heaven, and I'll go. And if they have a clear gospel, and they really, and then I can evaluate whether, but it's my ability, whether or not they believe it, I'll go, why then are you acting this way? And there are several people within the word of God that were believers in Jehovah, believers in Jesus Christ, that did not have the exact greatest lifestyle. How do I know? Have you read the book of 1 Corinthians? And they were called spiritually mature believers who have all things, they know all things, they've given all things, and yet they don't do the right thing. So this cannot be about an evaluation on who is a false Christian or not. The only way we know that is by what they tell us. And then we help them understand doctrine better. Why will they not be permitted to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because of lawlessness. Notice that? Now, is it true that they probably don't understand the nature of Jesus Christ as, his Messiah, as their Messiah? Probably not. But the main point here is lawlessness, which is anomia. Anomia is an alpha negative for namas, and it means not law. Does he say, depart from me, you never really believed in me? Does it say, depart from me, you're depending upon your works? No, it says you're practicing lawlessness. Now, what is lawlessness? Anomia is, is the one who is contrary to law. The one who does what is contrary to law, the one who practices, or actually, in this word, it's works. Uh, the word practice there is a working word. It's, a, it's an Aragon word. And so the person is actually working out fully lawlessness. In the tribulation, who is the man who sits upon the throne in Jerusalem is the abomination of desolation? What, what's another name for him? The man of lawlessness, same word. And remember, we talked about that in Revelation class on what Sunday is nine o'clock, in case you're wondering. And going back to Daniel, it is the king who does what he pleases. He forsakes all gods, including the true God, and does what he wants. He is a man who is completely self-willed, and he is completely lawless. In Matthew, lawlessness is attributed to those who oppose the Messiah and the truth. And to the Pharisees and scribes, the religious leaders of the Jews, the lawless ones are the ones who use the law for their own personal wealth and power, who are self-indulgent and commit robbery, and have the appearance of holiness but are full of dead man's bones. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 through 42, it says this. It says, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out um, of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. So this is at the end. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's going to gather. This is a gathering. People, oh, it's the rapture. No, it's not the rapture. Who is he gathering? He's going to commit. He's going to gather all the people who are stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so the angels will gather up all the people who are stumbling blocks, that is, the, those who commit lawlessness. Stumbling blocks are the ones who oppose the Christ, the ones who trip over Jesus and say that's not him, the ones who don't understand and actually working against the truth of, of Jesus Christ as Messiah. Furthermore, in Matthew chapter 23, 
Now go ahead and turn over here because, and we, we looked at this several times, but I think this is one of the major keys to the book of Matthew. If you ever want to like look at the book of Matthew through Matthew 23. And if you, if you begin reading in verse 13, all the way through to the end of the chapter, you will see that there is a strong contrast about what the Pharisees and the scribes teach. He calls them hypocrites. And this is where he gets into um, you are self-indulgent. You commit robbery. You're using the law for personal wealth and power. You've manipulated truth in God's word and added your own twist to things so that you can control the people. And in verse 27, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, and inside they are full of dead man's bones and uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men. Wait a second. I thought we were supposed to examine their fruits. You see how this works? Outwardly to men, they look righteous, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Who evaluates that? There's only one person who knows what the motives are and what a person believes. Now, of course, they're manipulating the law and they're using it for power and wealth. And it looks good unless you're using God's evaluation. See? As we have seen on the Sermon on the Mount, who are those who do the will of God? What's the will of God in the book of Matthew? Specifically, Matthew 5 through 7. Now, Jesus is presenting himself as the prophet. He is presenting himself as the Messiah. He is giving them information, trying to get their attention. Later on in the book of Matthew, he's going to do amazing things. And he's going to say clearly, and it's going to be very clear that he is claiming to be the one, the promised one of the Old Testament. But you read Matthew 5 through 7, and you wonder what the will of God is, according to Matthew 5 through 7. It doesn't state believe in the Messiah. It's all about the behavioral. I thought that was me. <laughs> it's all about the behavioral righteousness. And this is the scary thing for people who understand grace, right? Because they go to Matthew and they go, we don't want to talk about whether or not someone is good enough to be able to go into the kingdom of heaven because it makes it sound like it's by works. Let me go ahead and give you a clue. Entering the kingdom of heaven during the dispensation of law, is about works. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that, because that's what it says. It's not for how they, even they, are reconciled to God. They have to believe in Jehovah. They have to believe in their Messiah in order to be reconciled to God individually. But if they want to make it into the kingdom of heaven, if they want to survive the day, because the first, before the kingdom of heaven comes to the scene, what comes first? It is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is death, it's shadow, it is smoke, it is disaster. And only those who are practicing righteousness will survive the day. Not just believing correctly. But we get confused because we want to make sure that everything is about how we go to heaven. Matthew 5-7 through is not about that. In fact, the declaration that Jesus says, I never knew you, indicates that these people are not believers in Jesus as Messiah. So not only are they practicing unrighteousness, not only are they practicing lawlessness, actually working it out, making it come to fruition to the best of their ability, causing people to be stumbling blocks, using the law for their own personal purposes, they are in fact not believers because Jesus never knew them. And they are marked specifically by the fact that they are lawless. Let's go ahead and repeat this. As we have seen through our study of Matthew, of the Jews of that day would have believed, or if, they had, if, they, if the Jews of that day would have believed in Jesus, then the day of the Lord would have come. And if they wanted to survive Daniel's 70th week, then they needed to have the behavioral righteousness to be in alignment with God in accordance with his covenant 
and his law. So yeah, if somebody asks me, hey, can you go ahead and explain Matthew 7, 21? And I think kingdom of heaven means go to heaven. I can go ahead and argue with them. And yes, if somebody doesn't know the history of Matthew, and I try to go ahead and explain to them the fact that, well, this is actually about the Jews, they may just gloss over and go, Jews? The Bible's not written about Jews. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who said that to me once. <laughs> to what I said, what Bible are you reading? Um, I don't want to make sure we're on the same page. But if you, want, if you want to be clear and you want to make sure it's understandable and you don't want to sit there and misrepresent the scriptures, you have to teach this appropriately that this is about the kingdom of heaven. It's about Israel and the Jews. It's not about Christians or identifying false Christians. And it's about false prophets. All right. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and we'll actually we'll hopefully wrap up a little earlier tonight. Wouldn't mind that. I got a... Got a lot to do for the next week. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, two foundations. Not a difficult passage. This is actually pretty easy. The last one, one of the more difficult ones. A lot of people have different ideas. This one, not so difficult. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and the slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell, and it was a great fall. Um, so, two foundations. Jesus is telling them, my words are the solid foundation. Jesus is telling them his words are equated with what? The truth of Scripture. You hear the words of mine, and now you hear it, you actually take it in and you follow it, then you will have a solid foundation and you will not be shaken. Let me ask you this question again. What words has Jesus spoken? How would we characterize it in chapters 5 through 7? Because remember, in chapter 4, there's, there's basically this baptism. And these are the first words we have recorded in Matthew. And Matthew is trying to get to a point. If you read Matthew 5 through 7, it takes you about 14 minutes. I'm a slow reader. However... Do you think that it took Jesus 14 minutes to get all this out? Probably not. These are probably snippets of information. Matthew's putting it all together in one cute little, you know, three pages or so to try to have people understand a general concept. What words has Jesus spoken? Remember at the very beginning, we started talking about Matthew 5 through 7. And we gave it an understanding, a proper grasp. It was the true understanding of the Mosaic law. This is not about a new system. This is not about the grace to all people. That's in different messages, captured in different books. And specifically after Israel rejects, the, the message is, is, is therefore given to Paul to take out to all the Gentiles. In Matthew, he's talking to the Jews about the true understanding of the Mosaic Law. Those who listen to his words, but not only listen to them, are considered wise. So, they do the words, even though and, and listen to them, are considered wise. Any, anybody have a thought or an idea, a passage in Scripture that also emulates this truth? James chapter 1, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And, we, and when we dot James, we, we realize that James is not talking about how a person goes to heaven, but is actually very Jewish in nature. Do you think that maybe James was also influenced by the words of Jesus Christ directly? It was his brother. He was 
talked, he, James did see the risen Lord as well. And James became a very influential person in Jerusalem. And so be doers of the word, not hearers only, is considered to be a person to be very wise. It's not a difficult concept. We understand that, you know, hearing the truth and doing the truth are two different things. But what's interesting here is, how can it be obvious? When is it clear that the foundation is solid or weak? According to Matthew chapter 7. Hmm? When the rains come and the floods aren't anything, the wind batters, batters against the walls, then it knows whether or not the foundation is solid. To which the idea behind that is very good. But let me ask you a question. Do you know, or does the, the person who does it, do they know whether or not their foundation is solid or not? Again, a lot of misconception. This is not about self-evaluation. This is simply a state of truth. If you build upon my words, if you have my words as your foundation, you will be wise. And no matter what this world throws at you in Matthew, you'll be able to withstand. What, again, is Jesus talking about, about the circumstances of this life when he's talking to the Jews, specifically? We're going to get to this more and more in Matthew. What does he tell his disciples? You'll be treated harshly. You will have, In this world, you have tribulation. And he's talking about the day of the Lord, the 70th week of Daniel, Revelation 13 type of stuff, where wars are coming, beasts from the seas, beasts from the land, various different individuals are attacking the Jews. They have to run. But you guess what? If you hear my words and do my words, when that comes, you will be able to stand in that day. You will survive that day and you will endure and be saved because all of Israel will eventually be saved. This is the promise he's establishing. Now, can we take that and make application? We'll talk about that in a second. This does not mean that a foundation cannot be trusted until trial for them. It means understand the truth, understand the foundation, then you will have confidence in the day of that trial. Let's talk about some timeless truth here. Because we obviously, we take a look at this and we want to be able to apply this to us, right? And let's go ahead and talk, go back to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21, 21 to 23. And let's make sure we understand some basic concepts about who God is and what his truth is. Obviously, in Matthew 21 through 23, he's not challenging the disciples there going, Hey, John, Matthew, uh, Simon, make sure you're part of me because not it's possible you are just not part of me. And No, he is talking about the prophets. However, we also know that God knows who are his. God knows. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 19, it says this. Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Avoid worldly, chat, uh, worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Arminius and Pilatus, men who have gone astray from the truth, that the resurrection has already taken place, and they have upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal, the Lord knows who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. The point of the passage, regardless of what's happening around, God knows who are his. The passage in Matthew chapter 7 to the disciples, understanding that there are many false teachers, is assurance to them that God will properly deal with false teachers and false prophets. Whether they're saved or not is not the question. Obviously, in Matthew 7, they're not. For us, that's not the question. It's not self-evaluation. See, they're saved. God is telling the disciples, and also there's a lot of assurances also in the epistles that tell us those people who are trying to deceive you, those people who are trying to persecute you or harm you in some way, don't worry, God will take care of it. Even in Romans chapter 12 and 13, where it talks about don't take vengeance upon for yourself, 
Vengeance is mine. I will take care of it. So that's how we should understand Matthew 7. And as a timeless truth, taking Matthew 7, 21 through 23, making sure we understand that God knows and he will take care of it. The second one is foundations, are a consistent theme in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, various other sections in, in Galatians and what foundations are. What we know has to be part of who we are. We learn doctrines. We learn truth. Oftentimes, as believers, we take one truth, and that seems to be the only thing we ever hang our hat on, and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified, to which sounds good. But if that was the only thing he wanted us to learn, this book would be a lot thinner, right? As a reminder, which book is the only book written to unbelievers? John. It's the only book. Everything else written with believers in mind. So, therefore, there's a lot of information he wants us to know. Why? Foundations. What makes us stable? What makes us consistent? If we all we have is our eternal destiny in mind, and that's it. It's not bad, but it's all we have. How do we get from day to day? But if we understand the truth of God, not only in eternality, but also in this life, because he wants us to have life and life abundantly. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have comfort. He wants us to have assurance. He wants us to have love within our community, within our families. Those doctrines are there too. We're supposed to learn those doctrines, understand them, believe them, and put them to practice. If we do those things, if we take on the word of God, understanding what it says, then this statement is true. Doctrine overcomes circumstances. What's amazing sometimes is that even though we can be very prepared, the, math, the Matthew chapter 7 lesson is sometimes the only way other people see it is when disaster strikes. If we had the true foundation of Jesus Christ and his words, not just for salvation, but also for life, then when circumstances happen and the pressure of this life comes into fruition, if we have doctrinal as our basis, then we could still have joy and contentment, be completely content with who God is in this life, no matter what, it's, what happens to us. Of course, does anybody have a particular passage in mind in dealing with that truth? I know a few people do. Don't cheat. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians, written by Paul, under what circumstances? Anybody remember? He's in prison and not treated well. Um... He is not one, he, in chapter two, he doesn't know if he's going to survive this or not. He's like, I'm prepared to go. I hope I don't because it's better for you. But I don't know if I'm surviving this, this particular jail sentence. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We have trouble with that if we have a flat tire. Right? Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Talk about this with a, a with someone recently. Dealing with thanksgiving, what does that mean? It's, re, it's reflecting on grace. Understand what the grace of God is and reflect upon it. Be thankful for it. Because once you understand who God is and what God has given you, what grace is out there, guess what? The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is any, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Think about those things. That is the doctrines of God. That's the truth of God. You're to perpetually think about and dwell upon those things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. 
but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you had a concern for me. For indeed you had concern before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want. Paul is in jail, naked and afraid and alone. He says, I don't speak from want. I have no need. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. And in and, and, and any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Regardless of his circumstance, Paul is, has, is content and has joy. Why? Because doctrine overcomes circumstances. He understands the long game. He understands who God is. He understands what his purpose is. And likewise, if we build upon the foundation of Christ and the words of Christ, hear them, understand them, believe them, and put them into our minds and practice, we too can have that type of contentment, no matter the circumstance. Let's pray. In heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the opportunity to read your sermon on the mountain and to reflect upon it, which you had to say to both the Jews and Israel. And also some of the principles you have for them, you also have for us. Help us to be careful within the book of Matthew, not to apply things that are not applied to us, not to take warnings that are not for us, to understand what the kingdom of heaven is versus what our promises are. But at the very least, we can, we can grasp who you are and you what, what you want for them and for all men. We thank you that we have this opportunity. Help us to go in peace, to love one another, serve one another, to be gracious. We thank you. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen.